Computing um, that, uh, um, that 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 is called supercomputing, and um, which is by definition the most performant and general purpose uh, uh, computing high performance computing system that at any given time. And uh, just to say that uh, the, the, this question about performance is not so trivial. Um, uh, I, I just want to start with, on one side, we have the, the, the most, I would say, uh, successful or one of the most sold uh, um, computing systems today, large scientific computing systems. So many centers, for example, like the one we have, but in Germany, uh, HLRS, or in, in Sweden, uh, a number of uh, weather services, are all using this uh, uh, XE system uh, um, uh, from the company Cray. And uh, the interesting thing is that this computing system, um, which seems to be very popular, is, um, has been funded by a program. Uh, uh, the development of this system has been funded by a DARPA program that's called HPCS. And in this case, the P... Uh, or the, the acronym stands for high productivity computing. So there is this dichotomy between performance and computing that I would like to address. Uh, and the, 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 the dichotomy is, or the, this relationship between the two is not, uh, uh, not trivial or is, is relatively complicated um, because the, the, um, the program actually tried to fund two things. New programming languages that make it easy to program computers, and at the same time the development of, a, of a, an architecture that matches these uh, uh, programming environments. And it turns out the, the hardware was very successful. So a lot of computer centers are buying this computing system, but I don't know who knows here has heard about Chapel and X10, the programming languages. Two. Okay. So that, uh, and, and are you using? No. You just heard about them. So you don't have to be embarrassed about That's the level of, you know, uh, uh, knowledge or popularity about this. So, so um, the, the, the question that you can then ask is, do we as scientists care more about performance, that the, the hardware seems to go everywhere and we seem to be using it, but the high productivity we seem not to care about because, uh, uh, you know, somehow the, the, the work that's been done in that direction is not getting any traction. And so this is really the questions that I would, would like to reflect on uh, uh, in, the, in the next uh, hour or so or one and a half hours, one and a quarter hours, the time that I have left. And I would like to start to do this by thinking about what exactly do we mean by performance. Uh, um, in, in, the, in popular term, of course, performance is measured either in floating point operations, so number of floating point operations a machine, or you can do per second, uh, or today it's also common to, to talk about energy efficiency, just because it's popular, uh, everything has to be green, so there is even a, a green, uh, a list of the greenest, uh, most performant computers on the world called the Green 500 list, and uh, then you measure number of floating point 
operations you do per second and per watt. So that's like floating calculations per joule. And, um, and so these are the numbers that people track. And one uh, very probably well-known that probably more than two people know about, even in this room, is this top 500 list, the, the, this website that has been tracking the fastest 500 supercomputers uh, since the early 1990s. And what you see here is an is a exponential growth in the performance. Uh, uh, the, the fastest machine, the uh, sum of the uh, 500 fastest machine, and the slowest uh, machine. And you can see that a, a, an iPhone today is probably around here in performance, so it's about the same as a supercomputer uh, um, in, in, um, uh, you know, in the early... Um, uh, uh, early 90s. And um, uh, so it's, um, yeah, oh, yeah, exactly, that's here. So um, the, and, and the, the most impressive thing about this development is when you put in the numbers. So there are actually application codes, and these are the ones that typically win these Gordon Bell prizes uh, uh, that actually track the fastest machine. So this was the first time a teraflop was sustained in late 90s, and the first time a petaflop was sustained in 2008. And when you do the factor here, you see this is increasing at the rate of about factor 1,000 uh, every 10 years. And this has been going on for decades. So uh, I guess that's something we in computing we can be very proud of, you know, that there is such a, a, a great imp increase in performance uh, uh, over, over um, such a long period of time. And the same exponential growth in performance is tracked by another website. Uh, this is ECMWF. This is the Center for Mid-Range Weather Forecasting in Reading. And uh, here again you see an exponential increase uh, goes back even uh, uh, you know, earlier in the in the late 70s, and the the point is, and and which is again good. So for weather simulation, climate simulations, you have a, a, an increase. The the thing is, the difference to the previous one is this one is a factor 100 every 10 years, which is still very impressive. But you can say it's the same machines that run. On, that appear on the top 500, but here they only increase the factor 100. So, you know, being a physicist, you ask, well, does this mean the efficiency of the codes is decreasing a factor 10 every 10 years? Okay, which is not uh, good somehow. Well, the answer is, it all depends on what you measure. You will find out, okay? So what I would like to do next is look at exactly what we mean by this simple number, calculations per second, okay? And also the, the metric that we are using. The, this top 500 list is using the HPL, high performance impact metric, which is the, a metric, uh, is basically a, a solver of a dense linear system. Uh, uh, so it is dense linear algebra, and in dense linear algebra, we have a, 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 a property that is called... Um, uh, the arithmetic density or a quantity that we call the arithmetic density, which is the ratio between calculations and movement of data. Uh, so the number of floating point operations divided by the number of load stores. And in the case of dense linear algebra, this is increasing. Uh, the, the bigger you make this problem you want to solve, the, the more intense this quantity becomes. So it grows linearly with the scale of the problem. And the way you can imagine this is if you multiply two matrices, the complexity is n cubed. So n cubed operation, you have n squared elements, so n cubed divided by n squared gives you uh, that the density of the computation scales linearly with the size of the problem. And uh, so if you have a problem that's really dominated by floating point operation, it is reasonable to normalize the time to solution uh, by, uh, by a number of floating point operations. So this is time to solution divided by floating point operations. 
And if you want to minimize this normalized number, you have to maximize the inverse. And that's why you want to maximize floating point operations per second if you solve dense linear algebra problem. You can do the same reasoning with energy. And uh, so you see that actually these, this metric uh, uh, that top 500 is measuring is actually very useful, okay, reasonable. So what's wrong then with the, uh, with the climate codes or with, you know, that, that they get so less efficient? Well, there is some, uh, uh, as I said, we have to do two things on the computer. And this is profoundly important. It sounds simple, but it is profoundly important. One thing we want to compute, but we have to feed the part that computes with data. So we also have to move data. And so this is why this ratio between compute and movement of data in an algorithm is a, is a key number that you have to look at. And it turns out the reason this is important is in this so-called roofline model, where you uh, 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 plot the, uh, um, the, the uh, uh, peak performance of a processor against this density, this arithmetic density. And you can see that there is a range when the density is high enough where any of these processors, so these are Intel Xeon Phi or uh, Xeon, Xeon Phi, uh, NVIDIA GPUs, all kinds of processors that we have available today. There is an area where they saturate, but then once your arithmetic intensity is low, then or below this threshold, then the, 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 the peak performance of the processor decreases very quickly. And that's because the, uh, at that point, the the performance is, is dominated by the, the rate at which you can move data around, the so-called bandwidth of the memory. And what this picture basically tells you is depending on the algorithm that you run, uh, uh, you will have either, uh, so this is DGEM, this is matrix multiplier or dense linear algebra, uh, uh, you will have a very high peak performance and the climate codes are typically grid-based, partial differential equations, so stencils. And so in this case, the, the arithmetic density is low and the peak performance is order of magnitude smaller. Okay? And so depending on your algorithm, the performance of your machine is changing. And so that's a, a key thing that you have to keep in mind uh, when you develop codes and algorithms on a system. And um, so now that while floating point operations per second is something easy to memorize and think about, uh, it is not a good metric. So what are really the metrics we, we should worry about when we do computing and, and we should use when we talk about the performance is high? Well, the, I think the canonical metrics that we care about uh, are still time and energy. And um, uh, because they seem to be around in all problems. Uh, most of you scientists will, will worry about time. We want to design an algorithm uh, or design a, a machine that solves the computation in such a way that uh, the, the, the solution comes back, you know, while we still remember the question that we have asked. And uh, or, or for graduate students, you know, that your PhD is you can do it in three years and not in 10, you know, or, or, or 30 years. Uh, so that's the, uh, the, the restriction that we have on time to solution is um, we don't really have to minimize it, but you have to keep it low enough so that you can get your answer back in a reasonable time. And uh, so that's what we call operational constraints. I will come with an example where this is really illustrated. Uh, energy to solution on the other side, energy is proportional to cost because uh, I know that when you use a computer, you don't care about, about the person, provost or the president of your university has to somehow pay the power bill, uh, will actually care about that. And, uh, or if you run a large computer center and your computers use megawatts, and megawatt is a million a year, so you're interested in reducing the, 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 the power bill. And, and so we should always try to minimize energy to solution. So um, 
what I will now do before I get into condensed matter physics, I want to quickly run through an example where this is all illustrated very easily. It turns out the examples in condensed matter physics are a bit more difficult. Uh, I know they are also more interesting to you, but I will try to relate what we learn here with energy and uh, productivity and time to solution then uh, uh, l later also to the examples that I'm using from material science. The, 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 the simple example that most people can follow is this question of weather forecasting, because here it's easy, you know, you don't want to have the weather forecast for tomorrow, uh, a week from now. So you have very stringent constraints. And uh, so we are running a, at our center a, a, f a weather forecasting system for the Swiss Meteorological Service. And uh, this takes in data. The way they run is it takes in data from a global simulation at this European center uh, for mid-range weather forecasting that I mentioned before. They, they take this as initial and uh, uh, boundary conditions uh, uh, for a simulation over Europe at a resolution of seven kilometers, and then they run a high-resolution si simulation over the Alpine region, because if you don't have a high resolution, you don't really predict the weather very well. And then this is used for uh, daily weather, for, uh, you know, TV, forecast in TV or uh, air traffic control uh, and, and, and so on. And the machine we are using is a, a, a Cray XE6, so it's one that was procured in 2012, uh, three cabinet system. Uh, one cabinet is used for production, the other two are used for research, and if the first one fails, then uh, the other two take over immediately in the computation. Now, in terms of development, what uh, Meteo Suisse would like to do is go from a single two-kilometer simulation to uh, uh, one kilometer, so they want to double the resolution, and if they double the resolution, they have to increase the compute power by a factor 10. And then, in addition, they want to run an ensemble, because this is a chaotic, nonlinear system that we are studying, and so studying one trajectory is not meaningful in a, a chaotic system, so you need to uh, 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 study a, a, an ensemble of trajectories to make probabilistic predictions, and there again, they, every ensemble, the, the factor by which they multiply the ensemble members that reflects in the increase in performance, and they have to improve their data assimilation. So overall, what they want to achieve is a factor 40 in increase in uh, performance. And this is done, uh, uh, the, the last machine we built in 2012, so this is in three years, okay? And so in three years, a factor 40 means um, you have to, you know, th there's a factor 2 that you can gain, 2 to 3 you can gain from improving the processors in this time frame. So the rest you have to gain from making the machine larger. And uh, because it is fortunately a high, highly parallel problem. So this is the size of the machine today. This is our machine room in Lugano. This is the size of the weather forecasting system. Now, considering this factor 2 increase in performance, uh, we will need a certain size of machine. And I'm using, again, this Cray XE, uh, you know, packaging density and so on. This is the area of 40 cabinets of Cray XE, and I would need 30 of these to solve this problem. And so this is the size of the machine that we would have to increase to if we, uh, if we just move the code over to a bigger machine to do this bigger problem on faster processors, okay? And obviously, uh, the footprint rush roughly is proportional to cost in procurement and also to energy usage because they use around, uh, you know, per area you can say 90 kilowatts uh, of power, okay? And so obviously this is, uh, reflects a very strong increase in cost and we have to take somehow a different approach. Now, in the meantime, um, we have had a research group at, um, at uh, uh, ETH Zürich that has been investing in developing, taking the code, rewriting the code and moving it to GPUs. 
And uh, uh, we have, and so th what I'm showing here is just the result of this climate simulation uh, uh, running at different resolutions. So it shows you why it is important to run uh, at these high resolutions in order to, to predict the precipitation correctly. You see differences. But the, the main point is we're not talking about climate here. It's the main point is that we have developed software that can run on a totally different architecture. And, um, and so this will be the recurring theme in, in my lecture today. Uh, uh, you know, also on the condensed matter physics side that we have to invest in software development. It's probably one of the most important things in algorithms and software development uh, um, in order to be able to move forward. So what we had here is this climate code running on this uh, um, uh, uh, supercomputer that is loaded with GPUs. So it has hybrid nodes, 5,000 hybrid nodes of CPUs and GPUs. We will come back to this later with materials applications as well. Um, but uh, we, so we had this climate code that the meteorological service was using. And, um, and this is what we could use. I want to make some brief comments about this code. Uh, we went from an existing rather large, you know, 200,000, half a million line of uh, uh, code, Fortran code, a fairly monolithic code, uh, uh, very professionally written in terms of performance. And we ended up these codes, typically, they have two parts. They have a dynamics part that solves the Euler equations to move the air around and the, the um, equation of state to decide if you have uh, uh, clouds or, uh, or ice or snow or rain or, or sunshine. And, uh, and then there, there is a part that, um, that solves all the things that you have to parameterize uh, because, you know, you're, you're, you're not using you know, ab initio physics to, to describe things. Uh, uh, like, you know, the, the type of phenomena that you cannot resolve, that you have to somehow parameterize. So that's called a salt in the physics, so radiation, for example, and, and so on. So, um, uh, and, and so we rewrote this part of the code that the climate scientists would not touch normally. Um, and uh, uh, basically introduced a very structured, uh, you know, uh, uh, separated the, the concerns in, in this uh, part of the code in different libraries, in particular a stencil library where we um, uh, managed to separate the, the implementation side that of the library that we use, you know, that the scientists use who, who s implement the solvers from backends that um, uh, deal with the architectural details, whether you run on an x86 processor or on a GPU. And there is also a backend for Xeon Phi processors. And so it is this separation that makes it manageable to run the same code base on different architectures. And it turns out that with this investment in software, in the end, rather than building a machine that is x time larger, and costs much more money. The machine that we actually now just built and recently announced mm -hmm. is about the same size as the, uh, the last one. And, uh, uh, and is actually delivering the product now for, for Meteo Swiss. And uh, so I've, I'm here I'm summarizing uh, where we got the, this factor 40 in performance increase, where this really came from. because. What, what I said before was speculation. This is when you plan a project. Uh, now we have the two machines and we can make real measurements and comparison. So this is comparing the running the bigger, this big problem on the new system relative to the one uh, that we have in 2012. Okay. And so we get from increase in processor performance a factor 2.8. So a bit more than a factor 2. Okay. Then uh, improve system in utilization, so that's more to do with scheduling of the jobs. Uh, we got the fa another factor 2.8, so that's good. That's actually almost roughly 8. Then from just rewriting the processors 
and uh, rewriting the code without even going to uh, any new architectures, we get a factor 1.7. And then, so this is a, a already well-performing code, but rewritten. And then you still get almost a factor uh, 2 out. And, uh, and this is, by the way, something, the reason I mention this here is because we observe this in many places. Uh, 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 probably many of even the codes that are written in my group, uh, uh, will, will, you will see the same. That once you've written something, usually it's, it helps rearranging things and you get more performance out. And uh, then the, the important thing is then the rewritten code allows us to move to this new architecture seamlessly. And that gives us another factor 2.3. And then if you take everything together, uh, no, before I go to the result, uh, uh, one thing I would like to really quickly look at is this is what we get from Moore's law, from just processors continuing to increase. And I, I noticed you had earlier, I think this week, you had Matthias Troyer here arguing that Moore's law is coming to the end, and I totally agree with that point. Uh, and I will also come back to this um, uh, uh, so this is what we get right now from just waiting and not doing anything. And the, the factor will actually probably decrease as we get towards the end of the decade. Um, this is what we get from software refactoring, almost a factor four. Okay, B Basically, it allows us to run faster and move to new architecture. And this will be the alternative to... Uh, you know, while quantum computing is still maybe a bit further out, uh, but Moore's law will end before we use really big quantum computer to solve many, many problems. And in the meantime, you will see uh, the main point that I want to make with this lecture is the ability to move to different architectures will help us continue to improve performance. And uh, going back to this Meteor Swiss problem, if you do all these multiplications, you see you only need a 30% increase in number of processors. And that gives you a factor 40 then of overall performance increase. And then the nice bonus that we get is because we move to GPUs, the architecture is much more energy efficient. So we get, instead of a 30% increase because of this here, in energy consumption, we get the fact of three reduction in energy consumption. And uh, so that's basically what um, uh, uh, makes people, uh, you know, in the end very happy. Now, I just see here I have to... Um, uh, okay. So um, that's basically this you know extended introduction about what we we talk what we mean by performance okay performance is not really a, a simple number performance is uh, 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 dealing with uh, time to solution and um, energy to solution and uh, time to solution of course there is a factor of productivity that comes in and um, so what I would like to do now is talk about um, two examples in condensed matter physics. One is more in the area of many body theory, and the other one is more in the area of electronic structure theory. Uh, and I want to basically show that the same simple principles, uh, namely that we have to uh, uh, think really hard on what we are trying to optimize, uh, that we have to invest mostly in algorithms and in um, uh, uh, and, and software uh, refactoring uh, are really the, the crucial ingredients. And I will argue at the end of my lecture uh, that um, we have basically no choice because you can say um, then bite the bullet and invest in this whole endeavor because you could say, well, I'm happy with the performance that we have today in our codes or what we are doing. The problem is, as the, the computers are not going to just, a given architecture is not going to improve that much anymore in the future, we have to be able to move our 
problems to different architectures, like we have seen with this uh, uh, climate example. And, uh, and so this is one of the requirements that we have to deal with if you want to continue to, uh, you know, to solve bigger problems in, uh, in the future. And I assume, of course, as, as scientists, um, uh, we are, um, uh, uh, we are, um, okay, for some reason this, this whole build-up is uh, a bit strange here, but never mind. So the first problem I will talk about is this, uh, you know, models to, to describe uh, superconductivity, high temperature superconductivity. I know, assume you've heard uh, a lot about uh, uh, these type of models and, and things that we are using. So the challenge that we have here is we are dealing with a macroscopic effect and uh, a microscopic model, and we have this disparity of scale, and we have an algorithm uh, or a problem, the, the complexity of which is scaling exponentially. Uh, and so to get to macroscopic scales when uh, your, your, your problem uh, scales exponentially is not really good news. So, um, and you have heard earlier in, in this week and probably in this workshop uh, that uh, there is a solution uh, to, to deal with this challenge, and that is called dynamical mean field theory. Or in the case of superconductivity, we are using a, a cluster version of dynamical mean field theory that is called uh, um, dynamical cluster approximation, where you solve the many body problem on a cluster. That's the idea, and that is embedded in an effective medium. And the cluster should be large enough so you solve all the you, you basically cover all the important correlation effects uh, uh, that allow you that you need to treat to study the physics, and um, and then the, the medium takes care of the thermodynamic uh, limit or the long length scales, and um, uh, so so that's the the basic idea uh, of the theory that I will be. Um, uh, uh, using in this first part, and I just want to mention that this is work done in collaboration with a former graduate student. Actually, his yeah, I even wrote it. He's now at IBM. He's no longer at Zurich, uh, uh, ETH Zurich, and uh, Thomas Mayer, uh, a collaborator in Oak Ridge National Lab. Now, the the problem that we are trying to solve here. Uh, is the, the Hubbard model that I'm sure, again, you've heard of. When you have questions, please interrupt me. I'm making some assumption. And the main message of this talk is not in the details uh, of what we are solving here. Uh, so even if you don't understand every bit of the equations, uh, uh, you probably will still get something out, I hope. Um, but I, I still want to set the setting here. We're trying to solve the... the um, the, the Hubbard model, and we are going for this, um, uh, 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 trying to calculate the self-energy. Um, and um, the, the key idea of this DCA algorithm is, uh, of course, computing the self-energy from which you can compute wave functions or Green's functions or anything you want. So if you have that quantity, you solve the problem. Uh, uh, but uh, computing this is, of course, very difficult, and the, the, the basic idea of the, um, the DCA algorithm is to coarse grain the self-energy. So expand the function in terms of step functions. Uh, so you take the Brillouin zone and you cut it up into pieces, and then you expand it in terms of step functions of, of the, in, uh, the, these patches, and, uh, uh, and then you try to determine this finite set of expansion parameters uh, uh, somehow. And, uh, and of course, reciprocal space, each of these uh, uh, ways to, to split the Brillouin zone corresponds to a cluster in real space. And that's why the method is called dynamical cluster approximation. And just like DMFT, it is an iterative uh, method <coughs> where... Uh, you iterate between this lattice self-energy, this is the thing you try to determine, uh, uh, you compute, uh, um, uh, you, you map this onto a, 
a, a cluster by doing this expansion in, in, um, uh, in these patch functions, uh, uh, step functions, and then you, uh, you, you solve, um, you, you do a, a, a solve this in, in real space in a quantum Monte Carlo algorithm, uh, and then you map it back into the, the, um, uh, the, the, the lattice screens function, and, and so you solve this iteratively, where most of the computation is spent here in the quantum Monte Carlo algorithm. And I'll be saying a few things about this. So the, the main message about uh, this method what, that was developed by Mark Jarrell and Thomas Mayer, my collaborator, had a lot to do <coughs> with the uh, uh, applications to superconductivity, uh, is that you can qualitatively describe the phase diagram uh, at, as we believe we understand it in, in, in the coup rates. And so you get uh, a, a superconducting phase. You, you, uh, you can get uh, the, the <coughs> uh, pseudogod phase and, and uh, antiferromagnetism at uh, low doping and so on. So everything looks uh, reasonable from that point of view. There is just one problem with this method, and that is um, that it, there is a strong dependence on the shape of the cluster or the, the, the choice we make uh, uh, with um, uh, uh, the, the shape of these patches in the Brillouin zone, these coarse graining patches. And um, for example, this is uh, from a 2005 paper. Um, uh, you, you can see the TC. Uh, for the superconducting transition computed at uh, different cluster sizes. And so you can see uh, it is somehow converging, but it's fluctuating here. And, it's, um, uh, and you can see for a given cluster size, you can see two diff very different results in the TC. And when you look at the self-energy, this coarse grain self-energy, it looks very different between two different choices of these patches. And um, so people have been working, trying very hard to work on getting rid of this cluster dependence problem. And this is where the contributions from Peter Starr come in, um, uh, where he is trying to extend the, the algorithm uh, uh, to, to make the, the, the self-energy continuous. And the way uh, he is doing this is not just through a simple interpolation, um, uh, but um, through a, a, a basically a, a, a two-step process that is on, on one side interpolating and, and trying to make the function that he is trying to make smooth uh, uh, simpler uh, by, by subtracting a part that he knows roughly the shape uh, and, and then um, uh, in a second step he is um, deconvoluting so uh, trying to, to solve the inverse problem of, of extracting the, um, the, the, um, the, the lattice self-energy uh, from this uh, continuous set of functions here. Uh, and the result of this is that the, the self-energy indeed uh, becomes uh, smooth. So for this lecture, uh, uh, I think yeah, I have a reference here where all the details are described. The, the main point that I want to use this whole thing is what are the performance implications of this algorithmic uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, improvement. Uh, the the, the um, physics is improved uh, in, in the sense that, uh, as you can see here, before with the DCA we have this strong dependence on the uh, uh, shape of these coarse graining patches for the self-energy and the, the TC results and for, the, um, uh, for this new uh, uh, DCA plus algorithm we have a, a, a smooth um, and, and therefore also a, a, a self-energy that doesn't depend very much on the, um, uh, um, the shape of the cluster. Now the one of the performance implications is that <coughs> the, uh, the sign problem in the Monte Carlo part of the simulation seems to 
um, improve. So the, 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 the sign is, the, in, in the Monte Carlo simulation, the average sign is not dropping as fast uh, uh, with the increasing of the cluster. So the, the limitation why we cannot go to large cluster in these simulations is because the, um, uh, uh, in, in the uh, partially doped or in the doped uh, uh, Hubbard model, um, uh, we, uh, we are dealing with, with a sign problem that is basically stopping us at some point. You know, so we go from the n-cube scaling of the, quantum, the, the algorithm to an exponential scaling uh, at some point. And it turns out, <clears throat> as we are trying to show here, uh, uh, when you compare the DCA results um, uh, here, these are the solid curves, how the sign develops for different cluster sizes uh, 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 to these DCA plus results. And you say that this drop is significantly shifted <coughs> uh, uh, to lower, um, um, uh, uh, to, to, to lower temperatures. And so that allows us to run larger clusters uh, uh, all the way through the critical temperature in the simulation. And the question now is, where is this um, improvement coming from? And uh, since we don't rigorously understand the, the sign problem, we can also only speculate uh, where it is coming from. And it is believed that by making the self-energy smooth, we remove um, correlations that are artificially introduced. And, and this is basically <coughs> what improves the, the situation. And the, but the, the, key, <coughs> the key point is that this allows us to go to much lower temperatures and much larger clusters, and it will show uh, in the results that I will show in the end. But then there is a second part in the improvement, and that is the so-called cluster solver, uh, um, where uh, we are using this uh, uh, auxiliary field quantum Monte Carlo algorithm and um, uh, that's basically doing something very similar. Uh, um, uh, in the end, uh, 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 from a numerical point of view, uh, very similar to <coughs> what we used to do before in the, um, uh, in the Hirsch phi algorithm. Namely, we are using uh, uh, the, the core of the algorithm is, is basically boiling down to a, a vector outer product. So where we have two vectors that have to be uh, 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 you know, multiplied in an outer product to generate the matrix. <coughs> and one of the innovations that one can do there, and again the reference is given here, is that you, uh, you basically introduce an ide a blocking idea uh, where you you group together several of these vector outer products uh, uh, so that you change the outer product into um, uh, basically matrix multiplies. And what this gives you is it reduces, uh, uh, it increases this arithmetic density of the computation. Here it is very low and here it is higher. And then you move in this uh, you know, this roof line model that I showed in the beginning of the lecture, you move from low performance of the processor to high performance of the processor. And um, <clears throat> this again uh, 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 shows in uh, here in the, the results uh, uh, basically that you get a, a, a roughly order of magnitude or so improvement in time to solution. Uh, another part uh, that another algorithmic improvement is um, in the, this auxiliary field, um, uh, continuous time auxiliary field Monte Carlo, uh, when you, uh, uh, you, you introduce this <coughs> uh, random sampling of you know, time. So you go away from a fixed grid of, uh, of, of your, uh, uh, where you do the sampling on time. And, uh, and so this has vast improvements, again, in terms of the accuracy of the calculation. But because you introduce a sampling in time, 
you, <coughs> um, when you do the Fourier transforms from frequency space into uh, time space and back and forth, uh, your Fourier transforms now become non-equidistant. And the, the way this was naively done is to map this just on a very, very, uh, you know, fine grid and, and then do a very big FFT. It turns out you can do, use non-equidistant FFTs and then again <coughs> significantly improve the time to solution. <coughs> and um, the, so up to now I've showed an improvement in the method and then various algorithmic improvements in how I map the problem onto, uh, 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 um, you know, uh, 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 processors in such a way that I in use the architectures properly. So minimize data movement, uh, uh, here minimize the size of the problem that I have to solve. And uh, now the last step, uh, that uh, we are doing is, again, is an implementation step. So writing codes in such a way with a, <coughs> a, a parallel strategy to use uh, uh, different architectures. So what we are doing here is uh, we have, say, a, a computer with two CPUs per node and multi-core CPUs. So this is one line here is in time showing the computation of a, uh, an individual core. And the Monte Carlo calculation, you can imagine that very easily you can just split it over different nodes, the Markov chain, and you can um, uh, uh, split it over different cores, and then you have uh, 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 the green part, that's a Monte Carlo simulation, the red part, that's the, the measurements. And every core is just running independently. And, uh, uh, and, and so that's how you get very effective use of the system if you have a G, uh, two CPUs on a node. Now, on some of these modern and very high-performance machines, you have a CPU and a GPU. And here we split the problem. We take the costly green part, the, the Monte Carlo solver, and put it on the GPU and schedule it in such a way <coughs> that um, it, you know, the, the, this is just producing Markov chains, and then it is sending the results over to the CPUs, and then asynchronously is doing the measurements. And from this, we get optimal utilization now of a hybrid system that has one part is optimized to solve the dense linear algebra problems, and the rest is strong enough to solve the measurement parts. And this, again, leads to a, a significant um, uh, improvement in both uh, um, uh, in, uh, time to solution. I think that's what I'm showing uh, here. And as we will see later in also uh, energy to solution. And then, of course, the final step is we have to map the whole problem <coughs> onto a massively parallel system. So before I was talking about just one node with either two CPUs or two or G GPU and the CPU, and now we have to put the whole thing onto a, a large machine that has, in this case, uh, the, this machine Titan at Oak Ridge National Lab has somewhere around 18,000 uh, nodes. And, uh, uh, and, and that's what we are showing here, the scaling in number of nodes, yeah, 18,600 nodes, uh, and the parallel efficiency. Uh, and you can see, depending on the, again, the, the size of the problem, where we have to do uh, uh, larger and larger numbers of measurements, because we are also fighting uh, the, the sign problem, even though it is much better, <coughs> uh, uh, and then, of course, if we have large measurement, number of measurements, and the parallel efficiency, all the way to 18,000 nodes is still uh, relatively high, above 90%. Um, okay, and then the, finally put everything together, we get a certain time to solution on both the CPU or the GPU system, and that's what you see here, the, the, the time... Um, 
uh, as a function uh, uh, for either running on a CPU only system here or on the hybrid system. So that's just to show that it pays to do this investment and uh, deal with the architecture in the proper way. And then uh, the, in this case, time and energy is relatively proportional. So the savings we get in time to solution is also savings we get in energy uh, to solution. <coughs> and then uh, I, I need to accelerate a bit because I got started uh, a bit late. But uh, so we are, uh, uh, now that we have a much more efficient algorithm, uh, you know, for the various reasons that I discussed, sign problem, I uh, algorithmic implementation to reduce the data movement, increase the arithmetic density, um, and um, uh, using efficient, more efficient architectures, very large computers, we are in a position where we can actually run a problem and uh, 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 you know, solve this Hubbard model and uh, again, the, the things are documented in, in a paper, and you will have the slides if you're interested. So I will, I will try to go very fast, just saying that uh, uh, we are at, in a position to actually test the, the, this um, uh, 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 um, you know, solver of the, the Hubbard model in the attractive view Hubbard model where we don't have a sign problem so we can go to very large cluster and where we can use uh, determinant Nantel Quattro Monte Carlo uh, results that have been uh, uh, published by the, the group of Richard Scalatar. And so we can for the first time actually go all the way to making a rigorous comparison between the, the, um, the, the solver that is adequate for, for uh, you know, the, the repulsive model, but used on the attractive view model uh, uh, compared to a method that we know is, is uh, asymptotically exact. And so the, the results, as you can see here, they, they agree. And then we can apply the, the, the problem to, to looking at the, the high TC problem or the, the, the 2D Hubble model. In this case, for u over t equals 4. And this is just showing... Um, the, the difference between what we had previously uh, with the DCA, so these are the red dots. Let me put everything again on the slide. Uh, we see the red dots here. This is what we can do with the DCA, the old code. And then after we do all the improvements I've been talking about, we can really push the problem to very large clusters to the point where you can see TC is increasing as the cluster becomes larger and larger, and at some point the cluster is large enough, and then we see the, the, the asymptotic decay of the uh, TC that we expect from uh, 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 costalist Staules uh, scaling of the problem. And um, what you can see here is somewhere a, a sort of like a, a I don't know, a, a length scale. Uh, beyond which we see this proper asymptotic behavior. And now we can, we can do this really, uh, uh, you know, very accurately in the simulation. And so we can see uh, this uh, uh, costal installer scaling <coughs> and determine a, a TC, okay? Uh, we can even push things to larger use where the sign problem, again, is becoming uh, more problematic. Again, the difference between the old implementation, the red one, the old the DCA algorithm and the DCA plus algorithm, where again, you know, here you can see you don't get anywhere, but then you can, uh, with, with all these, again, improvements I've been talking about, you, you can get the point where even at, at the large u uh, over t equals 7, you actually uh, uh, get TC to converge. You see the same phenomenon again, um, uh, you know, that there is a, a length scale beyond which the cluster is large enough and you see the proper scaling of the problem. So in summary, uh, uh, when I now, you know, want to reflect on all the changes that have happened, we had improvements in method 
and we had mapping to hardware. And so we had, you know, initially the first results I show is DCA with here's Phi Quantum Monte Carlo. Then <coughs> we had delayed update. So this was improving the arithmetic density. And uh, so it's a mapping to, to uh, scalar processors. Uh, we had submatrix updates uh, that again improve the complexity. Then Emmanuel Gull and uh, the group of Matthias Stroyer, they developed the, uh, the CT AUX algorithm, and that's a tremendous improvement in accuracy of Quantum Monte Carlo. So that's impure. Uh, and, um, and then we again developed this is the paper I cited in the talk, uh, a, a, a sub-matrix update version. So these improvements here, but now for this algorithm, which is again a mapping on the architecture, map to hybrid computation, uh, improve again the algorithm with DCA+. Plus. Uh, uh, we use the same solver, so everything here just transfers. Uh, and then implement that scale and everything together allows us to solve the problem. And this, so this is really an example where I try to show in the same way like the climate problem that's like a, a bit simpler to understand but uh, not easier to implement. The models are much more complicated than the many body Schrodinger equation. Uh, but, but uh, I, the point I want to make is the same type of investment in algorithms and implementation uh, along with improvements in the architecture, so going from CPUs to GPU, that give you then the necessary improvements in performance uh, that we want to see. Now in the last part, I would like now to go to, um, to uh, electronic structure and uh, how it is used in materials design. So this is a, a, an argument uh, as, as material scientists we often have to, uh, because we're, we're solving complicated problems that most people, uh, you know, don't understand the problems we are solving. Uh, and uh, this is just to make the case that while weather simulations are important and we all care about, uh, uh, humanity actually cares about uh, uh, materials development uh, even more because we've even named the ages of development of civilization uh, uh, with um, the materials that we have um, developed and that, that have caused the development. <coughs> now, one of the uh, modern trends that we see in, in uh, 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 material science is that we actually use simulation for designing materials and um, uh, so one of the, the strong advocates of this in Switzerland is Nicola Mazzari at APFL, and the argument who is leading a big initiative that we have. And the argument is that when you develop materials, usually like the developments I showed before with uh, Stone Age, Iron Age, and so they were serendipitous discoveries, you know, that you can use something uh, to do a certain task as a tool or as a weapon. And, um, and then I, I would say, it's, uh, you know, around the time of Edison or also that uh, people uh, started to do systematic searches, but they were experimental searches. So apparently Edison was testing 3,000 materials for uh, the filament of the light bulb, you know, the famous uh, light bulb. And, and so you can imagine that's a lot of work. And then it's even worse uh, for the Harbour Bosch uh, synthesis um, uh, of uh, 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 <coughs> ammonia synthesis, uh, 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 it is said, uh, Mitas tested of the order of 20,000 compounds, you know. And, and this is a very important problem, you know, that's used everywhere uh, uh, in industry around the world, and you're saving a lot of energy if you, uh, if you improve catalysts, but it just gives you the scale of labor that you have to invest. And uh, <clears throat> so it was, you know, this is just in this context, but we have many other examples uh, uh, where, um, uh, 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 you know, simulations are used to help the development uh, of materials. Uh, one is this development of uh, tunneling magnetoresistance that I'm going to skip in the interest of time. 
and just say that what we are using simulations for today is this, um, uh, and this is representative of a workflow <coughs> where we, the, the main point here is we are uh, 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 seamlessly have an interaction between defining the goals, the, the, uh, 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 the design parameters of the material, uh, uh, finding comp candidate compound, trying to make a search there to, uh, and, and pre-screen using simulations <coughs> uh, uh, and then have, uh, 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 you know, on a certain number of compounds then do verification with measurements and if, if the, the, the measurements agree uh, with what we have been looking at with simulations, then, uh, you know, we can take the next step. If not, then we have to go back and so on. So the, the main uh, uh, message that is coming out, and this is again from Gerd Seder in the U.S. and Mazari, in, in, um, uh, uh, who used to be a colleague at MIT of Gerd, but now is at APFL, uh, is basically the, this idea of using simulations for materials design. And the key point there is you're no longer interested in one heroic big simulation like before, but you actually want to do, um, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of simulations because <coughs> uh, we, ha we know there are of the order of 100, 150,000 non-inorganic compounds. And if we really want to look at everything we have, uh, uh, if we want to uh, uh, study a, you know, a certain property and we have to study it in at least, you know, maybe not all inorganic compounds, but in, in, in a few thousand or a ten, tens of thousand. Uh, uh, so that gives us the scale at which we, that we have to deal with when we, uh, you know, how often we have to repeat the simulation. And so what I would like to do now in the remainder of the talk is reflect on, you know, what is possible today in terms of doing ab initio electronic structure simulation. <clears throat> so if we are on Titan, that's this machine I've been talking about, <coughs> and um, we, we take, say, VASP, and uh, so a very basic simulation, and uh, we can do roughly say in 10 minutes, an ab initio simulation on a good workstation, and that corresponds to one node on Titan. And we, assuming we can use the GPUs, then we can do of the order of um, uh, 18,000 structures in 10 minutes, uh, which is, you know, uh, uh, and even this machine that we have in Switzerland allows us to do of the order of 5,000 structures in, in 10 minutes. But this is for the very simple uh, basic simulations. So what I would like to ask, um, okay, so for some reason I've messed up my slides. Uh, what I would like to approach, ask now is approach the problem from another side, <coughs> namely, um, what if I don't use simple pseudo-potential code and small problem, but I use an all-electron code, full potential, and I use it on the largest problem that I would reasonably uh, uh, want to do. So I use LAPW <coughs> and uh, I um, use it on large problems and now you can say what is the largest problem that you want to do in say total energy type of calculation and of course there is no limit in principle you can do any scale of problem but uh, <coughs> uh, fortunately there is this nearsightedness of electronic matter that says that there's up to a certain scale that you need to solve the problem ab initio, and then afterwards you can use other tricks. And the scale is somewhere around uh, 1,000 atoms, and this was formulated by uh, Claudia Draxel. So she basically says, give me, uh, uh, solve me this problem, but not using simple pseudo-potential, but using uh, the accurate, exciting code, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and do it uh, in order to solve the design problem, do it not once, but we have to design the, prob the machine, the code, everything, so that we can do it many times. So I want to now discuss uh, how we are solving this problem and what is the footprint of this scale of calculation today. Now, it's obviously going to be a bit bigger 
than the, the one I discussed before, than if you would use VASP. <coughs> um, the, the problem we solve here is, and you know this is basically cone charm uh, equations using uh, um, uh, uh, this, this uh, a spectral approach where we end up with uh, generalized, having to deal with a generalized eigensolver, uh, which I'm sure everybody, or most of you, you've seen talks about this uh, uh, several times in, uh, during the course of this um, lecture. The specifics of LAPW is you use a matrix, uh, a, a basis, sorry, that is, consists of spherical harmonic expansion uh, 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 around the nuclei of the atoms, and then a plane wave expansion in, the, in between the atoms, and then you, you match the two functions with some uh, conditions that give you um, uh, the conditions for the, uh, sorry, I need to go a bit slower, uh, 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 these expansion coefficients here. Okay, so that, that basically defines your basis. And now uh, you have, once you have the basis, you get an overlap matrix and you get the Hamiltonian that you have to plug into your eigensolvers. Now, it's very natural that people will say, well, the eigensolver, um, this is the computationally hard problem, okay? It turns out that when you now put in this basis in, into this computation, uh, uh, you know, this is the equations uh, that, that you will end up having to solve. And the reason why you say this is the hard problem is because this scales with n cubed. So as you make the problem larger, so if I go from, say, 10 atoms to 1,000 atoms, uh, uh, then I have 100, 100 cubed in computational complexity be because of this problem. Okay? And so the natural thing is to attack this problem at scale. It turns out this is not the only place where you have the n cubed complexity, but when you look at these equations, then you have another matrix multiply here, which is also n cube. It's much simpler than the, the um, eigensolver. You know, multiplying matrices is trivial, but it's the same complexity. So if the prefactor is lower, you don't see it in small problems. But if the problems become large, you will see it. And so the main message is uh, uh, um, we have to focus on both parts of the code. And the bad news is, in a typical LAPW code, these computations are distributed over thousands of lines of code. And no applied mathematician has written a nice library for it. For Eigensolver, you have ScalePack, LAPack and ScalePack. So you have actually solvers. But uh, for this, you don't. And so if you put your nice library here, this will be fast. And then this will be slow in the end. And that's why you know, this 1,000 atom problem <coughs> has not been solved trivially yet. And uh, so what I'm trying to give you quickly is a feeling on how you solve these problems. <coughs> so the 1,000 atom problem is a 100,000 by 100,000 ma matrix, roughly, in LAPW uh, uh, basis. And this matrix is then split up in a block diagonal, uh, 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 sorry, in a, a, a cyclic, a block cyclic distribution. So you cut the matrix into blocks and you distribute these blocks over different processors. So uh, uh, blue, red, yellow, and green mean different MPI tasks on different processors. Uh, uh, so that's how you, you, so you split it and you distribute it. And this is how ScalePack is doing it. And, and so then the algorithms used here are optimized for this distribution. Since this is the most expensive part, this dic dictates the way you decompose the problem over a parallel machine. Um, then you see in these parts here, you have to, uh, when you have to do these multiplications over plane waves and orbitals, when you see how the sums are, the inner sum 
is over orbitals of the matrix multiplication. Uh, 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 so it's over this here, the, the, the column here. And then you see when you do the matrix multiply, you are basically taking data from all the processors in this reduction. So that means you have to move a lot of data okay, in order to do the computation. And so effectively, even though you're still uh, 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 multiplying matrices, but because the, ma the data is distributed over many nodes, you're effectively reducing the arithmetic density, again, over the entire machine. And you're bound by the performance of the network. And the remedy to this problem is now to look at the distribution and for the sake of the, these multiplications, not for these solvers you use this distribution, but for the sake of these multiplications, uh, move data, increase the storage on every node slightly, uh, uh, and move data around once, uh, and um, so that uh, uh, on every node you don't have one of the blocks, but for the given row that you multiply, you have uh, all the data that you need, and then you do the multiplies. And what this basically the result is, you pay a little bit in price in increasing the memory, but you reduce the the, the communication you do during the computation, and this uh, uh, results in in a that you are no longer bound by the bandwidth of the memory uh, of, the, um, of the network, and uh, uh, again, that the computation is going faster. Uh, so, so this is a trick, a, a common trick used when you try to solve distributed matrix problems. Uh, and here we are just uh, applying it to a very complex uh, you know, LAPW uh, uh, electronic structure code. Then we still have to de deal with the solver. And the solver uh, is uh, because we want to use now this solver in a, on a, again, distributed matrix problem. Uh, you can say, well, why don't you use scalar pack? Uh, I will show you results. Why not? And um, uh, also because we want to use uh, uh, GPUs again. So the, the solver is, you know, we have this generalized eigensolver that we use Cholesky decomposition to transform it into a standard eigenvalue problem. And then we solve the standard eigenvalue problem by tridiagonalizing the matrix and solving a, 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 this tridiagonal matrix, um, which is then simple. Uh, there, there are a number of algorithms, Thomas algorithm and uh, different types of algorithm that you can use to solve this problem. <coughs> and then you do a back transformation uh, 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 to get the, um, the eigenvectors uh, of your generalized problem. Uh, and the, so this is the, the standard algorithm, how it is used in scale pack. And um, the, the caveat of this algorithm is that this part here turns out to be a, 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 a low arithmetic density formulation. So it's a level two blast operation and is again bound by the bandwidth of the memory and not by the compute. So again, in this, um, uh, in, in this roof line model you know, that I had before, um, you know, when the performance is high and then this decreases, uh, this is logarithm of the performance. Um, uh, uh, instead of being over here, you are somewhere over here. So you have this reduction in performance. And uh, um, so there is, a, again, a trick how to avoid this problem. And that is make the co computation more complicated. <coughs> Uh, and, and actually do more computation, but because you will again end, move the arithmetic density from here over here, and you move less data, you end up um, winning in time to solution. So the trick is do a reduction to band, <coughs> and then uh, um, uh, try diagonalization from a banded matrix, 
and um, and then the the price you pay is twice. This is a bit more complicated, and then this uh, you have to do two back transformations. <coughs> uh, um, but it turns out in the end, because this is now a dense matrix problem, so it's a, uh, you go back from lower arithmetic density to high, you win so much here in time to solution that in the end you, you, pay, uh, uh, you can afford to pay this additional price for the back transformations. And uh, so there are um, an, uh, two types of implementations. Uh, one is a multi-core implementation by a, a, a library, ELPA library, uh, developed in Germany, in Garching. So anybody of you who is doing electronic structure or these types of problems, and you're using um, just a normal CPU, distributed CPU system, don't use LAPAC, but use this library, ELPA. Okay? This is very, works very, very well. And we have then... A, 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 a similar implementation of this very similar algorithms uh, uh, that uh, is in this magma library uh, and um, is running uh, currently running on this gray system uh, um, uh, very well uh, and I will now come to the results so the the results <coughs> um, what I'm testing on is a a, a problem um, uh, lithium intercalated uh, cobalt oxide uh, with a, about 1,500 atoms, so it's roughly 1,000 atoms, so it's this 1,000 atom has a, a 115,000 uh, basis function, so that's the size of the matrix. <coughs> we are running on our Cray XC30 uh, in, in, uh, uh, in Lugano, uh, which has um, this Intel Xeon Sandy Bridge processor and the uh, combination with uh, uh, NVIDIA GPUs. So we are comparing running the algorithm just on the CPUs with the ELPA library to running the algorithm on the hybrid uh, CPU this, uh, GPU system. And, um, and so we are trying to compare, and this is not really putting the two in competition, but what I really want to understand here is I take this problem, which I say is the, the biggest we want to reasonably solving materials design, and I want to understand how much resources does it take uh, um, uh, uh, to solve the problem. <coughs> and uh, so this is the result here uh, using, uh, the, so this is the MPI grid we're using, this is MPI ranks per socket, and uh, M <coughs> MPI ranks per uh, thread. So we are playing in some cases by putting two MPI ranks per node or per processor and uh, or one MPI rank per processor. <coughs> uh, uh, we, you could uh, try to put more MPI ranks. So this is this hybrid model between OpenMP and MPI. Uh, that, and usually, at least in all cases that I've seen, it pays to put more MPI ranks on a multi-core processor, but, uh, but the price you pay is memory. And normally you don't have enough memory, so you have to compromise and use multiple MPI, uh, uh, fewer MPI ranks, and use more uh, open MP threads per socket. <coughs> and um, so what you see here is the, using the scale pack and ELPA. And you can see the time to solution in the solver is dramatically different. R roughly here, a factor four. Okay, um, and um, uh, and and the overall time to solution also. Um, so this is really the di what you see here at play is this change the algorithm in the solver. Okay, and you also see in the the the. Uh, where do I have it? The, the new solver. Am I comparing this? Yeah, I'm. I'm. This is where I'm sure. No, let me see. Uh, 
are not showing the difference between th this different way of doing the distribution. But the, the main point I want to make here is this difference really changing the, the, the solver. So making actually the computation more complicated. But because it maps better onto the architecture, you get this factor four increase in, in uh, 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 time to solution. And then you get another in, uh, improvement in terms of the, um, using the hybrid uh, solver. And so overall, the, the, the message we get out is that typically on somewhere uh, around uh, uh, 400 nodes, um, we, we get a time to solution that's roughly around quote, 15 minutes to 20 minutes. Uh, and um, for one iteration. Now you say you need 10 iterations to, to solve the, the problem here. So for one solution, uh, um, so you need uh, 15 minutes for one iteration, three hours for 10. I realize that solving large problems, you need more iterations. But in, in, uh, on, in, on the other hand, you don't have to solve the full eigenvalue problem. Uh, you can use some other tricks to cut down. So roughly, what we are saying is for to solve one problem, <coughs> you need somewhere around 400 hybrid nodes today. On a machine with 5,000 nodes, if you want to turn around 5,000 compounds, you need somewhere around two to three weeks. That's today. But if we go, um, you know, we wait a few years, uh, we, um, we will get machines that are a factor 10 to 100 faster, we will have to, again, invest in the software development. So there's no free lunch. But <coughs> uh, uh, then the 16 days will come down to a few hours to do these very accurate, very large calculations and in the scale of you know, five to 10,000 of them. So that roughly gives you a feeling uh, of where things are. I'm including this slide, and you will get these slides in the slack. This is where I'm discussing this thing of uh, um, <coughs> uh, running the, the eigensolver with different distributions of uh, uh, between MPI ranks and threads. So this is one rank, eight threads, and this one is uh, uh, um, eight ranks and just one thread per rank. And you can clearly see the difference in time to solution. <coughs> also energy to solution, and this one is always the, the GPU part, or the hybrid part, which seems to be uh, faster in all cases. Uh, let me jump here. And again, similar to the climate uh, code before, after <coughs> uh, doing all these investments in how to deal distributed linear algebra, both in the solver and in the, uh, in the setup of the Hamiltonian, we end up again with a domain-specific library that um, uh, contains now all the tools that we need to, do, uh, to build electronic structure code. This library is then embedded in codes like in Exciting or ELK. We are currently working on Quantum Espresso. And the whole point of this, again, is to separate the code which most scientists use from the back end, these different libraries to solve the linear algebra problems, the I.O. problems, with, because it is these back ends that we are then mapping onto the different architectures. Okay? So I, I hope by repeating the same uh, argument now several times, to have made the point that I would like to summarize now. Uh, there, there are, again, uh, uh, some papers, the collaborators in this work. I want to highlight particularly Azam Haidar and Raffaele uh, Solcha, who have been doing, and Anton Kochevnikov, most of the work. So <coughs> what I really would like to stress is this need to structure software, both uh, in climate or material science or chemistry or astrophysics or so, structure software in such a way that you get somehow a separation between the architecture and the, the, um, uh, you know, the software that we use uh, as scientists when we build the models. And 
Uh, it turns out that, you know, it took me many, almost one and a half hours, a bit more than an hour, to give you these examples. And, I, well, and, and it, it looks very convoluted. And it is really convoluted. So unfortunately, it's not easy, uh, but it is really necessary. <coughs> um, and what um, I would like now to discuss in the last uh, a couple of minutes is the, the dilemma that we have today uh, uh, and, and how we have to organize uh, this type of work from now on, so today and in the future. And I want to do this in, in a number of examples. Uh, so we have just the one we saw. You know, this is this material science electronic structure problem. So we have a physical model. We have a theory, which in this case is density functional theory. <coughs> and um, then we have this mapping on, of this mathematical problem onto uh, uh, the machines that I've been discussing extensively. And uh, the, the code we have to write, the compiler, and the machine we run on. And so this is the, uh, a linear way of thinking, how we develop things. And uh, this, this is, in fact, the way we think about how we write codes or solve problems uh, since at least the time when I was a graduate student and probably long before that. And the reason this is a convenient way of thinking about this is because we can draw a line and we can say, OK, this part is solved by computer engineers. This part is the one we have to deal with. And, and, and life is relatively simple. Uh, you have seen on distributed machines, life can be a bit more complicated. Okay, because we don't have, uh, ideally we want to have a compiler that does all this automatically too, all this data distribution. But uh, uh, we haven't seen this appear. In fact, the same uh, uh, problem uh, uh, applies to molecular dynamics in biology, or the, 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 the things I discussed first, the, the quantum many body part. It's the same thing, it's just the model changes and the method changes and the algorithms, but the, the structure is the same. And even in the climate case, it's the same. Uh, uh, you have a model, you have Euler equations, you have a, a, a discretization, stencils, uh, implementation, and you run it on a computer. Now, why am I making this point? And to summarize, you know, all the suffering that we went through in the exa three examples I showed, the, the challenge that we have today is that we don't have one machine here. We have machines with Xeon processors. Then we have machines with Xeon Phi processors. There are not so many now, but in a few years, there will be really performance Xeon Phi processors, and you will see many of those machines. And uh, even Intel now will admit that this is not the same processor. It's a different architecture, and you have to uh, uh, invest a, a lot to change your codes to run it on here. And then you have GPUs, or you have APUs, and in the future, you will have ARM processors uh, as well. So are you going to change everything every time you change the architecture? Okay. And the, the fact that the architecture will change is just a reality. This is a consequence of this end of Moore's law coming that um, uh, we will see more and more architectures uh, uh, emerging and being sustainable. In fact, we see the precursor of this by just having this distinction of three different processors that I just discussed. So what it means is, the, this idea of separating the concerns is no longer reasonable, and we have to rethink the whole workflow. And the way we have to think about this is on one side, we still have physical models, a mathematical disc that's not going the math is not going to change. It's going to improve, but it's not never going to go away. Uh, also the algorithms and this need to discretize is never going to go away either. And ideally, we want to have a system where we can iterate between these three very conveniently without having to rewrite too much code. But then once we decide on algorithms and have thought along about this, then we have to implement, uh, compile, 
And then, and this is the part that is new today, we have a second and then a third N architectures to deal with. And the, the key is, and I hope to have made this clear in the, in the lecture, is depending on the architecture, we need different implementations and we need different algorithms. And, um, uh, and you know, this is where the need for labor comes in. And now you see, uh, given this graph of the distribution of the labor and the, the feedback on the labor, it is no re not reasonable to say, you know, we scientists, we write codes here and, you know, write many, many different codes. What you want is a separation of concerns that is somewhere at this level. You have uh, 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 many use just tools that are developed by others, and these tools are developed by, um, uh, by interdisciplinary teams. Um, uh, I, I, there is still a second line because we're using commodity architectures today, uh, but the main point here is that we would like to use a productive system like a Python system here, and we would like to have tools that implement these uh, algorithms uh, 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 on these various architectures. And so what is the difference between this picture and the previous one, or, you know, how things were in the past. In the past, we had things like just scalar pack. That was the, the uh, generic libraries that are used in many, many places in science. In this picture, we will need libraries that are domain-specific, like for the climate codes, specific libraries for the domain of climate and earth science simulations or specific libraries for electronic structure simulations. Uh, and in order to develop these libraries, you need teams that are made up of, hopefully, some people from this audience, and um, then applied mathematicians and computer scientists. Uh, uh, and in order to create a platform that is productive for um, uh, uh, you know, the remaining scientists that are just using the platform uh, uh, to solve their problems. And um, uh, what I hope to, to do in the, you know, with uh, this lecture is to motivate those of you who are interested in the more technology side of the implementation of things to really think about in the future of your career also think about uh, uh, joining these type of efforts. I believe there is a uh, uh, in, the, in the same way like when we build large experiments, like at LHC or so, uh, you have a lot of people who are involved in designing the, the actual experiment and, and building the machines to build that. And this would be the equivalent uh, of this in, in uh, uh, various domains. So I think I've, uh, yeah, given that I was a bit late, I, I think I should stop here so that we still have a break. Uh, uh, enough of a break left. Uh, thank you, uh, and I don't know if there are questions. Uh, and I'm here still for the rest of the morning and early afternoon, so I can also discuss questions later. Um.